In the 1950s, there was a television program. It's called The Adventures of Superman. And there was a guy named George Reeves, and he played that particular character. And he tried to have the high morals of Superman. But he learned to be very cautious with his interactions with young children. Because the young children thought he was Superman. They saw bullets bounce off his chest when they would watch him on television. And they just assumed the same thing would happen in real life. And so there were times this uh, man, George Reeves, was assaulted by children. But you see, Reeves could seek to be like Superman. But we all know if the kid pulled that trigger, he wouldn't have bounced off his chest, right? He would have been killed immediately. That fictional character, Superman, uh, was like a god. And, and Reeves could never be equal to what the fictional character was. Uh, and, but he could be like that fictional character. And in that same sense, we should be all like our Father in Heaven. We should have that attitude like he has, not putting on like a, acting like you're a character in a, in a program, but really living like our Father in heaven, having that heart like he has, right? That should reflect within us. But we will never be our Father in heaven. You understand? You can't be God. I love how the kids, they're all right into that. Yeah, I agree, I agree. In 1966, one of the most popular bands in the world was the Beatles. Now, some of the kids here today, they might not even know who the Beatles are. But they are, were one of the most popular bands back in 1966. And just as a disclaimer, I was not around in 1966, okay? Uh, but, but they were. And um, John Lennon at that time made this proclamation that he had become more popular than Jesus Christ. And this is what he said. He said, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right, he said. We're more popular than Jesus now, he said. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. Can I tell you something? John Lennon was a very arrogant man. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, Jesus has changed the world in ways that we can't even begin to fathom. And this man was saying that he was more popular. Amen. He, he was greater than Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? We can't even get equal with Jesus Christ. Amen. Though we try day by day to, to be more like Jesus Christ, we can't even get in the equal mark. I sure ain't knowing nobody that's in the greater than Mark, when it comes to Jesus. It seems many throughout history have had it in their mindset that I can be greater than Jesus. I am greater than Jesus. Many throughout history have uh, said, come worship me, bow down at my feet, think how great I am, you know. Many have made that proclamation that they are greater than God, but there's only one man who ever walked this earth that can claim equality with God and have the Evidence to show it. His name is Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Jesus Christ. Today I want us to understand, now I speak about that man named Jesus Christ, then I am speaking of one who isn't just like God. See, a lot of people think he's like that. He's just like God. No, I'm talking about someone who is equal with God, okay? And that is incredibly important to know. You know, my brother here just a moment ago talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? They do not believe that Jesus is equal with God. That is a key foundation of your salvation. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you cannot be saved. Because He couldn't have done what He said He did for you, all right? Now, um, last time as we were going through uh, the gospel here of uh, John, uh, we realized that Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath day. And boy, that made people mad. They, had, uh, he had, they thought he had worked upon the Sabbath. They considered that blasphemy. He had worked in their opinion and, uh, on the day that God had said to rest. And uh, Jesus' explanation for why he had worked 
in quotations, on the Sabbath day, made him even angrier. So that's what I want to read here next. If you'll uh, uh, open your Bibles to John chapter 5, verse 16, and if you'll stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word here this morning. And the Scripture says, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, and sought to slay Him, because He had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh here too, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. You may be seated. They said uh, he is equal with God. He is making himself equal. How can he do that? He's just a man, they said. But you see, he was more than a man. He was more than that. This, uh, this one, what was he saying though? And I think this is key to understanding what we're going to look at here today. What was Jesus saying? Was he claiming to be equal with God? Meaning that he is God. Is he equal with God? Or was he saying that God wouldn't withhold compassion from this man on that Sabbath and he can't either? It means that he is like God because God has a compassionate heart. If there is somebody broken and it's the Sabbath day, you think God won't heal you on the Sabbath day? Do you think God won't heal you because uh, we regularly don't work on Sunday or, or some particular thing like that? Do you think God's heart is not bigger than everything else about Him? Do you think God isn't love? God is love, therefore we are showing love, right? Everything about us in that regard. And I think Jesus is saying a little bit of both here. And let me explain. In the 1950s, there was a television program. It's called The Adventures of Superman. And there was a guy named George Reeves, and he played that particular character. Some of y'all may have heard of that, may have known of that. Uh, he played this invincible character called Superman. Superman was like a god, right? He took the role he represented to children very seriously by playing Superman. Whenever he would uh, go out, he quit smoking when he took on this role. He also, whenever he was around any children, he made sure his girlfriends were nowhere around so it didn't impact the, uh, the impeccable character of Superman, right? Because he was supposed to be this really good person, this really good character. And he tried to have the high morals of Superman. But he learned to be very cautious with his interactions with young children because the young children thought he was Superman. They saw bullets bounce off his chest when they would watch him on television. And they just assumed the same thing would happen in real life. And so there were times this uh, man, George Reeves, was assaulted by children. For example, he tells a story about uh, how he was as come as the man of steel to go visit these, uh, these kids. And one of the kids had found a gun that his dad had brought home from World War II. And the kid had loaded the gun, he brought the gun out, and the tense moments, he pointed the gun at George Reeves with his Superman emblem on and said, Superman, let's see that bullet bounce off your chest. And George Reeves did not miss a beat. He looked at him and he said, son, he said, don't, don't fire that weapon. He says, don't you know that it'll bounce off my chest and hit one of these people near us? Therefore, the boy gave the gun up to him in that tense moment. But you see, Reeves could seek to be like Superman. But we all know if the kid pulled that trigger, he wouldn't have bounced off his chest, right? He would have been killed immediately. That fictional character Superman uh, was like a god. And, and Reeves could never be equal to what the fictional character was. Uh, and, but he could be like that fictional character. He couldn't affect those bullets. He couldn't fly. He couldn't run at super speed. Reeves couldn't do that. And in that same sense, we should be all like our Father in heaven. We should have that attitude like he has, not putting on like a, acting like you're a character in a, in a program, but really living like our Father in heaven, having that heart like he has, right? Amen. That should reflect within us. But we will never be our Father in heaven. You understand? You can't be God. I love how the kids, they're all right into that. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And Jesus' answer here shows that to us. Being God isn't the same as being equal with God. But first, Jesus describes what it's like to be like God, having a heart after the Father's heart. And that's what I want you to see in here in verse 19. He says, then answer Jesus and say to them. Remember, he, they've made this idea, you're equal with God. Well, let's look at what equal with God is. And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, 
but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and sheweth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel." You see, Jesus had been accused of breaking the Sabbath, but Jesus made the accusation that God don't start walking on the Sabbath. God don't stop doing good things on the Sabbath, right? Amen. God's work doesn't take a break. Since the fall of Adam in the garden, God had been working to bring mankind back to him within his fellowship. And his compassion shows that he is unceasingly working to bring the gospel out to all people, right? And in the same way, we should as well. If you've been saved... You should live your life in lockstep with God's mission. And that's what Jesus shows us, isn't it? What did he say here? He said the Son can do nothing of himself. We can do nothing worthwhile without God. Amen. Remember Jesus saying that I am the vine and ye are the branches? If you're a branch set aside from the vine, you're a pretty miserable little branch, aren't you? You ever try to do Christian work without Christ? It's a miserable endeavor. Can I tell you that? You get out there and you're, you're, you're putting it on for a show to let everybody look at you and you never get to get anything done. Oh, you might bring in all sorts of people to come in. You might bring people from all over the place to hear the Word of God. You might do all these different things and gather up all this, but it would mean nothing in the end, will it? Because it was not done for Christ in Christ. Amen, amen. It all must be done for Him or it is useless. And Jesus tells us that here. And then he says, What things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise, and he will show him greater works than these. You see, we should be a reflection of Jesus in this world. He wants us. Listen to me. He wants us to do great things for him. Some of us think that we got saved so we could sit in a pew. No. God wants you to use what He gave you for Him to do great things. Great things, not minor things. In John 14, 12, Jesus said this. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I shall do, he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Did you know how much Christ's followers have changed the world? For the past 2,000... Do you know what it was like 2,000 years ago? We were all barbarians, our ancestors were, drinking the blood of our enemies, okay? Compassion was considered a weakness. Pride was considered a virtue. And women and children were treated like animals, okay? But then came Jesus along, right? And he stepped into the midst of human history and he literally changed the world not just by all that he did at that moment but what he did to his followers who would go out throughout history changing the whole of society around us. And uh, you know old Lennon, he said there, well it's going to be gone. Seems like old John Lennon's gone now, right? Jesus is still marching on, isn't he? Christ's followers have changed the world. The love of Christ has caused us to have compassion on our fellow man and quit living like barbarians in this world. Jesus changed the world by multiplying His love and compassion a billion fold through all His followers. You're a picture of Jesus in this world. People are looking at you, at your workplace, your school, and they're looking at you, Christian, and they're saying, there's Jesus. Will I reflect Him? To them. And not only that, he said, The Father loveth the Son. Can, you, can I tell you that everything about God runs around the idea of love? Everything. Everything runs around the idea of love. God loves us. And those Jewish leaders, they thought, listen to this, they thought God hated Jesus because he showed compassion to this man by healing him on the Sabbath day, after he had laid out on a pool for 38 years and couldn't get up, and they thought God hated him for bringing that man to get up that day. <laughs> Is your God a God who hates others? Is your God who works out of hate? Can I tell you, you might be following the wrong God if you are following that one. Our God is a God of love. This is what the Scripture says. In 1 John 4, 16, it says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. Amen. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, 
and God in him. This is what it means to live a Christian life. It means loving people enough to tell them the truth when they're out in sin. You hear me? There's a lot of people get up and they claim love, love, love all day long, but they never say anything about sin. They never say anything about the, the place these people are heading who are, are, are bound up in these sinful acts. They never say a thing about it. <clears throat> and can I tell you, they don't love them. Amen. They love the applause of men more than they love like God does. As Reeves went so far as to change his life to reflect that character of Superman, we seek a life of daily repentance to the high calling of Christ, our Savior. It's even more than that. This is what it means to be like our Father. But Jesus makes it very clear that we cannot be our Father. Okay? And that's what he shows us here in these next few verses. <clears throat> Look here at verse 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead... And quickeneth them, even so the, man, the Son quickeneth whom he will. <clears throat> For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honor the Son, listen to that, even as they honor the Father. Wow. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Praise God for that. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment. To execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. You hear this? The hour is coming. In which all that are in the grave shall hear whose voice? Jesus' voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. See, old George Reeves, he couldn't fly, could he? He couldn't run at super speed. He couldn't reflect bullets. And folks, I tell you what, Jesus did things of a godlike quality for reality. He did the miraculous. He healed this man of 38 years, got him to get up, and his legs instantly gathered muscle and sinew and tissue, and he was able to stand immediately after he had not walked for 38 years. Folks, that ain't no Benny Hinn thing, okay? <laughs> that nonsense that goes on with that. That's real. Jesus spoke and the man's legs were healed that very day. He did the miraculous and he did these things like God. You see, he gave life. It says here he quickeneth. That's what it means to give life. And there's a future day when all in the graves will hear his voice. Remember when, when he came upon Lazarus' grave? And he stood outside the tomb and he spoke and he said, Lazarus, come forth, right? Remember that? I remember my dad preaching that same passage. He said, said if he had just said, come forth, he said they'd all come out that day, right? Why? Because he's the authority. Amen. He's God. And God says when death is taking place, God says when life can take place, only God can do that. So our Jesus is equal in that way. But not only that, he can bring life right here today. You understand what I'm saying? You have been living, if you are a sinner who has never received Jesus as your Savior, you have been living in death your entire life, okay? You're in death right now. And Jesus can speak life into you. And how does that happen? Look at verse 24. It said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. God can save you here today. He can make you new. He can bring real life into you. Only He can do that. Only He can do that. Today, if you'll believe, it says. Not only that, it says here that He honoreth the Son just like He honors the, the Father. He says that Jesus receives worship. No man should receive worship, right? Only God can receive worship. Only God. Now the devil would like for you to worship him all day long, right? And some of us may have played in his band before. I don't know. But God can do... God is the only one worthy of worship. So it's very clear here that Jesus is saying, 
Worship me just like you do God. And there's no blasphemy in that. But listen to what he says here. He says that he is the son of man and he will stand in judgment. Now he's not, I used to when I was younger I thought, well son of man, that's just saying he's a man, right? No. No, that means more than that. That's a title that shows that he is the Messiah. He is the promised one sent from the foundation of the world to save the world by dying on the cross for the sins of the world that they might receive him by grace through faith. Listen to this in Daniel chapter 7. It was prophesied of him uh, in verses 13 through 14. It says, I saw one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven. Jesus is going to come back. and He's going to break open the scrolls of the, the clouds one day and he's going to come back. First, he's going to receive us up in the rapture. Then seven years later, he's going to come back and he's going to touch down upon this earth. And when he does, he'll come to the Ancient of Days, God himself, God the Father. This is beyond our minds. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Jesus is coming back to judge the world. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? He is God. He has judgment. He has worship. And he has life. Will you receive it? Amen. Finally, this. We can uh, be uh, like our Father in heaven. We cannot be our Father in heaven, but this is beautiful. We can be with our Father in heaven. All right? Look what it says here in verse 30. It says, Jesus speaking, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which, sent, which has sent me. Now, God isn't like those Jewish leaders, God, who ties heavy burdens on mankind and is distanced from their problems. You see, this idea of being equal with God, God is a trinity. He is the Father, He is the Son, and He is the Holy Ghost. In a few minutes, I'm going to baptize this young lady. And I'm going to say I'm baptizing her in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, the true God who is God, who always will be God and always was God, okay? Amen. And I'm going to say that. But to understand the idea of that Trinity, that's a perfect bond of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost in that idea of love. Remember I told you God is love, right? Before this world existed, before time existed, before anything existed, there was love. You hear me? Uh, the relationship of the Trinity uh, shows this perfect relationship of love. You see, if God wasn't a Trinity, if He wasn't Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, He was alone for eternity. And it could not be said that God is love, right? Because there was no one to love. He is one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, all in this perfect bond of love together. Why? The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Holy Ghost loves the Son and the Father. There's this perfect communion there, right? This perfect bond of love. That's within this church. We are bonded together in love. And we're called into that love. I don't know if y'all realize this, but the last time we had the Lord's Supper, I, I added a verse uh, that I, I usually read to the beginning of that. I, I found this verse and God showed it to me and it really reveals something precious to me about this. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14 through 17, it says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. And there, he's talking here about the Lord's Supper. And there's some people that bow down to the Lord's Supper. They believe that God, that Jesus' flesh and blood is actually what you're eating and drinking when you do this. But it's a spiritual picture that's what's taking place there. He says there, The cup of blessing which we bless... Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? He says, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And listen to what he says. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. The definition of communion, of what we sometimes call the Lord's Supper, is a showing of, exchanging of intimate thoughts or feelings. And the idea is when we sit down and we take communion, we're remembering what God did for us. We're taking in that love that he, he did for us. His body broken for us on that tree. 
beaten, bloody, broken. Why? Did he deserve it? No. That's his love he showed for us. That blood that poured down the sides of that tree, that blood that was ripped and torn from his back as they hit him with the whips, that's love. Amen. That's love. The body broken, the blood shed for you and me. And what does it say in that verse? When we take that in and we have that intimate connection with God, as we're taking that in, we're, we're taking in that idea of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and what He did for us. Our love comes part of that Trinitarian love that's been out around for all of eternity. We come together and loved with one another here today. And that's what heaven's going to be like, isn't it? Is that not what heaven's going to be like one day? When all hate is gone, when all sin has been put away, and all that will be left will be the people of God and the great love that the Son had for them throughout all of eternity. Oh, what a day that will be, right? What a day that will be. Are you prepared for it? Are you ready for it here today? You've got to receive Him. I'm going to give you a moment here to do that. Right here. Right here. This morning. You can receive Him by grace through faith. How does that work, Scott? If we confess Him, the Scripture says, if we confess the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, ye shall be saved. And then it says that you will not be ashamed of that. Meaning you'll come and you'll receive it. You'll, you'll come and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You'll stand up and say, Church, I won't, I, I've asked Jesus to save me. I've seen tons of little kids and people and older people and younger people and all sorts of people come up and receive Jesus as their Savior. And when they walk away, if they really received Him, they're a new creature in Christ, aren't they? Amen. Aren't they? Amen. 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 So I'm going to ask us to stand right now. Brother Harry, would you like to play for our altar call today? Amen. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to come. Maybe it's to receive salvation. Maybe today you just want to get things right with God here today. Can I tell you something? As we're going through this life, sometimes we get off out of the way. We get away from what God wants for our lives, don't we? We head down in a bad direction and our relationship needs to come back together. The Scripture says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you can come down here and you can get cleansed from all unrighteousness right here today if that's what you'd like to do. Well, I'll pray with you. I'll put on this old mask and I'll pray with you. We'll, we'll stay so far apart and I'll pray with you about it. And you can lay them sins upon this altar here today. Or maybe you just won't come up here this morning and pray for somebody that you know that needs it. Folks, I'm so thankful for the tears that were shed on an altar so long ago for me when I was out in sin. Right? You can lay that down here today. I don't know. I don't know any of these things. Between you and God, what you're going to do here next, okay? Between you and God. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.